any questions you might have and save them for the end. I'll leave about 20 minutes for us to discuss, discuss the crisis response fund. If there are any clarifying questions, um, is there any way they can like do pop-up chats? Yeah, so we, uh, you can raise your hand and actually also you can uh, type on the uh, chat box and I'll be saving all the uh, questions for the end. <coughs> yes, great. Thank you so much. And Laura. in case uh, anyone can't hear us properly, also the same, please just type it in the chat box and I'll be picking it up. Okay, fantastic. So just to start with an overview, we can go to the next slide. I'll, I'll just give you information about what the Crisis Response Fund is and what the specific focus areas of the fund are so that you know whether or not you're eligible to apply for the fund, um, how to apply if you're interested in it. Um, also, we'll then speak to the timelines for processing the grant, given that it is an emergency grant. And then we'll spend a bit of time talking about the outcomes and impact that we want to see from applicants when we're busy um, processing and implementing the grant before we do conclusions and questions. Great. So if we go to the next slide, um, just to say, the Crisis Response Fund um, was established originally in 2007 at Civicus, which actually serves as a, a tool that we provide to civil society organizations that allow them to respond to events that threaten their ability to function or violate their rights to freedom of assembly and association. Since its inception, we, we go to the next slide, um, the crisis, there we go, the Crisis Response Fund has actually supported partners from across the world. Um, you'll see we've had quite a nice spread of applicants. We aren't, uh, within this mandate, able to give any funds to partners in the USA. Um, because the funds are processed through U.S. State Department. But you'll see as we go through the next slide um, that, you you know, the, the donors that, that support this grant um, are not just Western-based donors. Um, the other thing to note for the fund is in addition to supporting national initiatives, we also support regional or international initiatives that are facing restrictions on freedom of assembly and association. So you'll see at the bottom, we do regional grants as well. And then if you go to the next slide, basically the Crisis Response Fund is part of the Lifeline Consortium, which is a consortium of seven NGOs that are funded by 19 donor governments. And I'll tell you who those donor governments are. If you look at the yellow circle, Five of the seven NGOs only give emergency grants to civil society organizations. So they don't give individual grants. And I'll tell you what type of grants are available to organizations. However, two of the grants give, two of the organizations give grants to individuals. Um, so human rights defenders needing legal action or emergency assistance to leave countries um, or just like any sort of intervention for an individual in addition to CSOs. We work collaboratively. So these, these seven partners all have their own grants. The Civicus grant is called the Crisis Response Fund. However, if you reach out to Civicus and you say, I'm an individual and I need a grant and Civicus isn't able to assist you, we would then refer you to Freedom House of Frontline Defenders if you are an individual. If you are an organization and you meet our mandate, then we'd happily proceed with processing your grant. So, as you, can, as you see from the previous slide, the seven international organizations include Civicus, ICNL, uh, Silk, Forum Asia, Freedom House, Frontline Defenders, and People in Need. The governments that support the Lifeline Fund is Australia, Benin, Canada, Chile, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Mongolia, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Sweden, the UK, the US, and Uruguay. So it's a wonderful spread, I mean, even to be able to receive funding 
from South-based governments in Latin America and one government in the African continent. In addition to the normal funders that, that, that usually give, give money to organizations. And what we ask of this donor steering committee made up of 19 governments is that they make not just a financial contribution, but a political or an advocacy contribution to the fund. So whenever there are crises that need urgent uh, intervention from our partners, we flag these with the donor steering committee and we ask that they raise these matters, not just in council, but also through bilateral um, diplomacy between the governments. And as we go through the next few slides, you'll see that we also require that they, um, that we, that our partners engage with the, the, the embassies of these countries in, 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 at a national level. The grants are generally for emergencies and not only that, that they're for six months. So these aren't meant to be long-term grants, but we do require that they respond to a specific emergency and that they, they run for, I mean, it doesn't have to be the full six months, it can be three to six months, basically. So let's talk about the first grant that we offer. The first grant on offer is an advocacy grant. Uh, this type of emergency assistant assistance actually has to be in response to a specific restriction that an organization is facing. And it can include a restriction or a crisis because government officials have started to make public statements that condemn civil society organizations. Because we see that there are draft laws coming into place or newly implemented laws that um, restrict freedom of assembly and association, or because we see that they are having registration challenges because government is feeling threatened by civil society activities. They're now saying that civil society organizations, for example, can only register through consultation with the minister and can only, for example, receive certain types of funding. So no international funding or local funding or restrictions on the type of activities that they can do. We also support uh, civil society responding to restrictions on assembly. So for example, if states of emergencies are frequently declared when partners are trying to engage or protest or mobilize, then we see that as a threat to civil society more broadly speaking. We also see that um, arrests and intimidation and the use of force against civil society actors and activists is particularly problematic and where we are able to support um, advocacy grants around that. Just to say that for the advocacy grants and even for the resiliency grants, when we speak about CSOs, we're also talking about collectives of people. So these can be formal and informal civil society organizations. They can be movements or protest movements, trade unions, um, collective bodies um, of workers, even if it's not a union. Um, and then they can also be your more traditional civil society organizations that can be supported. Um, and when we, when we look at the, the applications that we receive, what we want to see is that the activities that the partner has proposed is actually in response to the restrictions that, um, that, are, that, the, the, that the country or the civil society organization is facing. So if you submit an application and you say in the application that government is passing a new law that will make it illegal for civil society organizations to receive funding from international actors, but your activities are really around freedom of expression or ensuring that there's public advocacy around um, protests, then the activities aren't aligned to the restriction that you've highlighted. And so remember when you're applying for the fund to ensure that the restrictions and the activities are aligned. Um, also remember when you're applying for the fund to ensure that the restrictions you're speaking to are relatively recent. So don't necessarily highlight a restriction that happened, for example, when decolonization was taking place and the government had a policy or they didn't change a law framework um, from the 1960s. Ensure that the restrictions that are taking place are ideally you know, within the past six months because it is an emergency fund, it is short term, we'd prefer that, that these, these, these types of grants would actually be more pertinent, contextual and relevant to the context that you're facing. Um, 
And so some of the activities that you could propose, and these are just examples, um, you could propose a workshop if your context is relatively open with government officials to highlight how their statements are particularly problematic for the functioning of civil society around freedom of assembly and association. Um, you could use an advocacy grant just to focus on CSO partners and movements where you develop a national strategy to respond to a closing civic space. Um, you could do one where you have meetings, like I mentioned with the donor steering committee, which we encourage um, so that people, the, the, the governments of the donor steering committee are able to engage in bilateral di diplomacy. And you could obviously do media engagement through op-eds, news interviews, radio and podcasts. We do have a preference as the first step of intervention that partners prioritize national advocacy. Um, I say this because basically what we found in the past is that with the, such a small grant, partners would typically focus on doing international activities. So going to the Human Rights Council with very little impact um, on the, the, the state that's guilty of the violations. So our priority is really for partners to have a tiered response to the restrictions where it's feasible. So focus, for example, on building solidarity or doing national level advocacy to increase the, the ability or the long-term impact of the grant. That said, in unique circumstances, so for example, we know in Saudi Arabia or we know in Ethiopia until recently that the restrictions are so severe that it's absolutely impossible under any circumstances to do national advocacy without risk of life. Um, and so in instances like that, we're open to more collaborative or regional or international uh, advocacy initiatives. And I mean, if you can make a compelling case for why you need to attend CSW, for example, in New York or General Assembly, or the Human Rights Council sessions, then we're open to having a discussion about what that would look like. However, we do prefer that partners prioritize national advocacy where appropriate. This national advocacy where it's safe can take place in country, but for example, if there's a large exile community that's able to do advocacy from out of country, those are some of the activities we also are able to sponsor. <clears throat> I will say though that given the, 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 the nature of the work that our partners do and the security concerns, um, and given that our reporting goes, for example, through US State Department, we do uh, offer to our partners complete privacy um, in their applications. So when you're applying and when you're doing your reporting, we're able to black out your name and ensure, for example, that you're not picked up um, by anyone. So you're not being followed, you're not being tracked, um, and there's no way for your own safety to be compromised. Um, we also offer to our partners the ability to speak to one another or engage with us through secure means. So we encrypt all of our emails, um, we are able to talk via Signal or WhatsApp, whichever is more secure, for, uh, or even to, for you to apply through Proton Mail. For example, you just need to let us know how the best way is for us to ensure that you're safe. So as you see in the yellow box, the grants are generally between 10 and 20 US dollars, uh, 20,000, sorry, not $10. <laughs> so 10,000 US dollars and 20,000 US dollars. Uh, if you're generally an, a civil society organization, you're functioning alone, then you can apply for around 10 to 13, 13 max really, unless you can motivate for why you would need up to 15. The 20,000 US dollars is generally available to consortia. So collectives of civil society organizations that are working together on a specific issue. Um, I will say though, if you look at that red block underneath, is that whilst we encourage partners to apply for grants for restrictions on assembly and association, they can't be issue specific applications. So if you're facing a challenge because you're an early childhood development organization 
and children's rights are being violated and this might in 10 years or in their adulthood affect their freedom of assembly. But that's too issue specific for the, the, the criteria of the grant. Similarly, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> for disability or for LGBTIQ plus issues, if the restriction you're facing is because you're running a queer or, uh, a organization that focuses on queer rights or that focuses on disability rights and your, your partners aren't able to participate because of their specific issue, that's not really uh, applicable to this grant. Rather, what we encourage partners to do instead is if they have issues, they should be applicable or gen that you could you should be able to generalize around the issue. So if the if an LGBTI organization is facing an issue around registration and this issue is not just affecting them, it's affecting a whole range of other organizations, then we would say that this is a restriction on association that needs to be attended to. Um, these issue specific type of applications are covered by other funds, not just by our partners, but by Civicus. So from the beginning of next year, we'll be offering a solidarity fund that focuses on freedom of expression where LGBTIQ plus issues will be covered. Um, and so it's not to say that Civicus doesn't care about these issues. We do absolutely care about them and we do absolutely want to support them. Um, but we can't actually do that under the crisis response fund directly. We can do it indirectly. Um, and I'll give you an example from the African continent. Recently, the African Commission on Human and People, People's Rights had removed the observer status of the Coalition of African Le Lesbians based on the intervention of states um, because it's an LGBTIQ plus organization. Um, this fundamentally violates the freedom of association of Cal to participate within the African Commission activities. And so the grant that we would issue would be around providing support so that this infringement on the right of association isn't something that's transferred to civil society more broadly speaking. So I hope that's it. that example is clear, but if you have any questions around that, you're welcome to ask more questions. Um, great, we can go to the next slide. The next grant that partners can apply for is actually called a resiliency grant. So we recognize that the advocacy grant is around emergency assistance and that sometimes it's more appropriate to be preemptive in our responses and develop resilience against the threats that civil society faces. <coughs> I hope you'll all excuse my cough, I'm a bit sick. Um, so basically the resiliency grant is meant to support the most at risk CSOs in taking preventative action to avoid or mitigate threats before emergencies erupt. These type of activities, these grants uh, support type of um, security processes um, for civil society organizations. So for example, we help civil society organizations assess their digital security we know, for example, that one of the ways in which governments have been able to target organizations and movements is through monitoring and targeting their websites, taking them down, and uh, monitoring their, how their ISP, or the internet service provider, is collecting information on them, collecting information on the users of the site, for example. Um, we know that a lot of partners might not use secure emails, and so government officials are very easily able to hack into emails or to listen to phone calls on WhatsApp or maybe not WhatsApp now that it's encrypted, maybe Facebook chat or Facebook call. And so we'd encourage partners to apply for this grant so that they can assess how secure their digital footprint is to ensure that they are safe from any restrictions on assembly and association. Similarly for physical security, we uh, encourage partners to have a look at their premises, where they're keeping their documents, are they keeping it on site? If they're keeping it on site, is that safe? You know, what are their rights around uh, police officials uh, accessing their property? What does the legal framework provide? And so they could, an organization could provide training to do an assessment of their properties, you know, 
So for example, in Uganda, we had a partner whose premises were broken into. Um, we've had partners whose premises had been firebombed um, or petrol bombed by security officials. Then we also uh, encourage for the resiliency grants, partners to look into protocol and procedural security. So, you know, I mentioned documents earlier. Do you need to store your documents on the property? If you're storing them off the property, where's the best place to store them? How do you ensure that you have copies of everything? Um, how do you, I mean, and it's not just about the security of documents. It could also be in response to uh, a, a, a probable threat. So <coughs> we have an Israeli partner who supports uh, civil society organizations in the Palestine to receive funds and resources. And recently the Israeli government has began to say that they want to monitor access to, to funding by Israeli organizations who they've been labeling as terrorists or in support of terrorists. Um, and so a protocol or procedural security resiliency grant would allow civil society in Israel working for Palestinian partners to develop a strategy um, on how they can access funding, um, perhaps through cash or through individual benign. Just that one, yes. If you go onto the Civicus website and you click on the what we do, under the defend uh, tab, you'll see the crisis response fund. When you click on that page, you'll find the application form. You'll find the frequently asked questions. Um, you'll find um, information about some of the activities that we've supported in the past. And you'll be able to, uh, sorry, you'll be able to engage more with the content. Currently, our frequently asked questions is only available in English, although our website has been translated into um, Spanish and we're hoping in the near future to have our website translated into French as well. So we do offer um, the content on that web page in multiple languages. The application forms are also available in four languages, which is Spanish, French, uh, Portuguese and English. Um, for those partners who are more comfortable speaking any of the other languages um, that is in English and you have any additional questions, we're generally a great, responsive, engaged bunch of people. And so don't have any issues reaching us, out to us and scheduling a call so that you can ask any questions about your applications. We'll be able to sit with you and walk through your application. And you know, it is, as you'll see when we do the, the process of application, it is an iterative process. So a lot of back and forth and discussion, um, but this is designed to help you apply uh, successfully. So like I said, when you get the application form, read through the documentation, the guidelines and the protocols, which I understand that after this call will be made available to the people who've been in attendance. Um, we ask that you complete the application and the budget. Please note that we don't co cover any personnel or salary costs directly. And even though there's a section for that in the budget, that must be left blank. However, what we encourage partners to do, I mean, we know for a number of you, it's incredibly difficult to do this work without salary costs. We encourage you to put your salary costs as administrative costs. So put in a line that says indirect or direct administrative costs, and we will cover it that way. We're also able to cover consultancies where it makes sense. So for example, if you have a research consultant that's supporting your work, um, you can put that cost in there. But for your organization, you're able to cover these costs as per, as per um, administrative costs. I will say, and I mean, this is sort of, I think for all of us, administratively easier. If you have any line in your budget that's over 3,500 US dollars, um, so any individual line, so if you have a line, say for example, for food or refreshments for a conference, and that line is more than $3,500, we need you to provide three quotes from independent service providers that show that you chose, for example, the cheapest option or where you did not choose the cheapest option 
that you chose the option that made sense for a variety of reasons that you should justify. Generally, we ask, and you'll see when you engage with myself or Mawetu, who's the administrator on the project, and he's usually the person you'll hear from more than you'll hear from me. When you engage with Mawetu, he will say, I've noticed you've got a line over 3,500 US dollars. I ask you to rather um, uh, lower that line and distribute the costs elsewhere, unless it's unavoidable, and in which instance we'll ask for three independent quotes. So I had a question from someone uh, last week who asked what a quotation is. Um, I don't know if that's the same um, here, but it's just like a, like an invoice or a expense sheet that you'd receive from a service provider. I'm not going to assume that you don't know what a quotation is. Um, I'm sure you do, but I know that it was another language group that asked what a quotation was. So if anyone is unclear on any of that, please feel free to reach out to me. <coughs> the next bullet point actually says that our applications are processed on OFAC and SAM. So OFAC and SAM are international databases on terrorists. Um, and by this, we don't mean terrorists that the government says, well, you're working in human rights, so you're in violation of our terrorist law. We mean actual terrorists. Um, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware, for example, those affiliated to ISIS or Al Qaeda. If your name is on the OFAC or SAM list, we will not proceed with the application under any circumstances. Um, and this is, I mean, obviously because our, the 19 governments process their money through USAID, but also I think because, I mean, it's just risky activities to engage in as a civil society organization. And we don't want to damage our reputation by being affiliated with organizations that may be pro-terrorism um, at, at that scale. Um, so, I mean, I know this is a, quite a political issue. I know it is contentious and we, we understand the, the limitations it places. But if you have any concerns about OPEC and SAM, we're ha happy to have the discussion. But unfortunately, our criteria at the moment is that we cannot process your grant if you are on the OPEC and SAM databases. The other thing I will say is, you know, for example, in some instances, funds, uh, civil society organizations are not permitted to receive funds from international actors. So, you know, in Egypt, that's uh, illegal, uh, punishable. Um, and so what we encourage civil society organizations to do is to either identify an individual or a partner who can receive funds on their behalf. Similarly, for the dispersal of funds, we can also, through our network, identify uh, partners that can receive the funds on your behalf. The only thing that's important here is that there must be an individual, whether it's your executive director or the leader of the movement, who must give surety and be able to do financial and narrative reporting for those funds. Great. Um, so if we go to the next page, it's just a, a continuation of how to apply. So depending on the risk criteria, we can issue grants in two or three tranches. Because I think a number of you on this are Civicus Network members, your risk uh, significantly lowers, which is an excellent thing. Those of you who are not part of our membership, I really encourage you to join. Um, because, I mean, not just for access to the funds, I think there's a whole range of wonderful benefits of being part of the Civicus Network. So for low risk partners, so generally that means you have a history of receiving funds and doing financial reporting, you're a Civicus member, um, and you're, you're known by two or three other partners. Usually what we would do is we would issue 80 to 90% of the grant in the first charge. Um, we then ask the partner to spend the full 100% of the grant um, and when they give us their financial report and their narrative report for that 100%, then they receive the 10% back from us. So basically, think of the last 10% as a reimbursement. 
we give you the 90% of the full amount you ask. So if you ask for 10,000 Rand, we'll give you nine, $10,000, we'll give you $9,000. And then you'll spend 10,000 US dollars and we'll pay you back the remaining 1,000 US dollars when you submit your financial and your narrative reports. We've done this because in the past, we used to give 100% of the grants, but what we find is that partners then wouldn't submit their financial and their narrative reports, which would ultimately compromise our own ability to report back to our funders around the, how the money was used and if it was effective in the narratives reports. And so as an incentive for partners to give us those narrative and those financial reports, we ask that they spend the full 100% once they've received 80 or 90% and then to submit their financial narrative report and then get the remaining 10 or 20% back. The same thing happens for partners who are high risk. And here we define high risk as sort of loose collectives. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Least collectives of movements, for example, very horizontal structures that haven't worked together before, for example. Um, high risk could also be like an unknown organization in an area that we've never worked in that's not part of our membership. Um, or it could be a new organization that's never received any funding before and has never implemented any work uh, or activities. In these instances, we give the tranches, uh, we give the tranches, we give three tranches. And so what would happen is, for example, we'd say we're going to give you 60% um, of the grant uh, for the first tranche, 20% for the second and 20% for the last. What the partner would do is similar to the, the two tranche method is when they receive the 60%, they'll spend 80% of the grant then they'll submit their financial report and then they'll receive the, the remaining, they'll receive the 20% as a reimbursement. So they receive 60%, they spend 80%, Civicus will pay them the 20% that's outstanding. Then in order to receive the last 20% of the grant to make it 100%, they would spend that last 20% and then Civicus would reimburse them upon receipt of their narrative and financial report. So they'd have to do three, uh, two rounds of financial reporting to receive the full grant. Um, just as a calculative, so as a monetary example, if you ask for 10,000 US dollars and we say to you, we're going to give you 6,000 US dollars, um, you need to spend 8,000 US dollars and then give us your financial and narrative report, and then we'll give you 2,000 US dollars reimbursement then you do that and then we pay you back. Now to get the remaining 2,000 US dollars to make it 10,000, you have to spend that remaining 2,000 US dollars and receive the 10,000. I mean, this is another way, I mean, when you're asking for a grant, if you can't afford to do activities um, for 15,000 US dollars where you pay 20% uh, yourself to be reimbursed, then think, rethink your budget, revise your budget, make it more in line with 10,000 US dollars or even less if that's appropriate. We do actually encourage partners to reapply in the context of an ongoing crisis. So for example, in Nicaragua, in DRC, in other contexts, we've given uh, grants to not just the same partner, but to multiple partners over the past few years. For an individual applicant, we ask that you wait one year since receiving and concluding your activities to apply for the next grant. Um, this is just so that we can distribute the emergency funds as widely as possible. The CRF is not meant to be a constant flow of funding. It's meant to be an emergency fund for crisis situations. So just be sure when you're applying even for the second or third time, we've had partners who've received four or five grants, when you're applying for the second or the third time, that you um, ensure that you're responding to relevant or contextual crises. We're almost done. If you go on to the next slide, <coughs> we generally process the grants within six to eight weeks 
after you, we receive your application, you'll hear from my colleague, Mawetu. He will review it and screen it, which means he'll also take it through OFAC. And he'll call you and he'll ask you questions about your activity. I'll also provide input on the focus of your grant and whether it's relevant. Um, then what we do after it's reviewed and screened is we submit it to the Lifeline Consortium for approval, revision or rejection. Basically, the consortium, all seven NGOs who run the fund, are able to provide input and comment and support on all of the grants from all of the partners. So all seven NGOs have to submit approval um, to, the C to the Lifeline Consortium. We do this so that, you know, where we're supporting more than one partner in a certain country, we can see the parallels and encourage them to work together. Uh, we can pick up general trends that we need to raise with the Donor Steering Committee, and we can provide advice to partners um, work so that they can work collectively and have greater impact. After the approval or revision, you'll then go to the contracting period. Obviously, if you're rejected, we won't go forward and we'll give you a reason for why your application was rejected. Generally, I mean, if you're a terrorist organization or if you're found to be a terrorist, you will be rejected, but we generally don't have very many rejections at this stage. Um, we usually inform you in the very beginning if we see your application is in line with our mandates. Um, after the contracting period, we'll pay the first tranche and then you'll begin the implementation. You'll then give us your financial and narrative reports, then you'll receive the last tranche. And then importantly, please, please, after three months, submit an impact report. We're very unlikely to uh, issue more funds to you as a partner in the future if you haven't given us any indication of what the impact of the grant has been. So please do consider doing that. <coughs> we receive a lot of questions around what we mean by outcomes and impacts. So outcomes are generally realistic consequences from the interventions, and they must be clearly linked to the restriction and the proposed activity. So for example, if there is a new legislation, your outcome might be a statement from a government official to review the restriction. So he might say, I'm going to review it. Um, you might have media engagement with a certain number of media outlets. You might have created a backup, backup website that you've stored as part of a resiliency grant. Or you might have a strategy that you've developed and shared across a number of organizations. So these are very realistic outcomes that are based on the activities that you propose. Um, impact here is really a broad change that ideally we'd be able to attribute to the grant that has been received. So for example, if we see generally people's attitudes towards civil society organizations have improved, that could be an impact. Or we might see that a draft law has been stopped, repealed and amended in line with the call of a number of uh, CSO organizations or activists, then that would be an impact. Or even engagement between two governments around the restriction, um, that might be an impact. I would never ever actually say that democracy would be an impact because we know, for example, that might be a long time coming. So try and be realistic. Don't say democracy. Don't say world peace. Um, you know, just ensure that for both of these, because this is how we're assessing the merits of giving you the funds, just ensure that for both of these, you're very realistic about what you can achieve. So the next, I don't know if it's on, will the video play here? <coughs> oh, it's an image. Um, there is a short video, which, uh, do you have the PDF by any chance? Mm -hmm. mm. But maybe, do you know what? The video is three minutes and it is on our website. There is a video that's on our website um, that gives us gives, gives an example of a partner who's actually an AGNA member who received a fund, uh, the CRF fund, and it was, yeah, it helped them achieve what they, what they had hoped to achieve. It gives examples of activities 
and specific impacts that is possible. Um, so I encourage you to have a look at that. I'm aware that we have about nine to 10 minutes left and I'm happy to take any questions that people might have. I'll be sharing the link on the chat box, uh, just one minute. So anyone has questions? Already Alexandra from Fond. Yeah. Um, hi, Alexandra. <laughs> Asked the question and I guess um, it was answered. Yes. Um, Chris from Malawi uh, asked us if individuals apply for the advocacy grant on cross-cutting issues. Uh, Chris, would you like to um, elaborate on this? Hello. Hi, can you hear us? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, I'm happy to give give that an answer. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Because the Crisis Response Fund is designed to support more than one individual, it's okay if you're a collective of individuals, you know, even if you're not part of an organization or a specific movement, if you're more than one individual, if you're not one individual person, you, you can apply. Um, but generally, you know, we give funds to more than one person. We, we don't typically fund um, individuals. Where individuals want to apply for cross-cutting funds in response to a violation or restriction that they're facing, we then put them in part with um, either Freedom House or Frontline Defenders. Um, yeah. <coughs> I can show the video actually now. Dr. Uh, You've asked us to do it while we are here, and I guess we have the time to do that. Great. Could you really show it? Yes. Yeah. Just one second. Okay, my name is Walia Kaspo from uh, the Gambia Council for Social Development. Um, we, uh, early this year, in the middle of 2017, received and support, the lifeline support uh, grant from uh, Civil Trust, uh, and we undertook activities around the state of emergency uh, that was declared by the President of the Republic of South Zambia sometime in July, because we were afraid the declaration of this uh, public state of emergency would result in uh, suppression of the people's freedoms and the abuse of the rights of the people, of the, of the people in uh, Particularly those that were uh, a sort of uh, a spoke against the government and its policy. Uh, this, uh, by this, I mean people like the opposition political party representatives as well as civil society. But we undertook uh, various activities, which included uh, an engagement meeting with uh, the, the ministry in charge of uh, uh, justice. Then we also had the police. This was the first uh, meeting we had. It was a national consultative meeting on the, uh, the declared state of emergency. And after that, we also had activities around <coughs> monitoring of the implementation of the claim declared state of emergency. And uh, this was meant to acquire evidence of abuse by the police who are uh, mandated uh, implementing or enforcing this declaration. So as a result of our activity, I think there was engagement with government and there was an understanding between government and civil society. And uh, we were actually uh, given the mandate by the Minister of Justice himself to report any kind of abuse by police and any other state agencies who are meant to enforce this kind of uh, declaration. 